I have a specific goal this morning. Even as the Lord spoke to us some time ago about hosting convocations and so forth, to be honest, um, even as we've said publicly before, we, we wrestled for a little while because in all honesty, I said, Lord, I, I'm not interested in joining the conference cycle. Like we, There's plenty of other things that we have going on. And the Lord said, you say conference, I say convocation. Okay, fantastic. That settles that. But I said, Lord, what are you asking us to do? And we really felt that the Lord spoke to our hearts and said four ingredients are necessary. And more of this will come out in one of the sessions tomorrow by, by pertaining to revelatory things um, that I feel specifically to share in a gathering tomorrow. However, for right now, the Lord said four things are necessary. Fast, pray, worship Jesus above all things, and declare the word of the Lord. Now these things sound they sound foundational. We know them to be fundamental. They even sound elementary until you begin to actually unpack what it is that God is saying and the implications of such statements in your life and in mine. I really feel by the Spirit to spend time speaking about fasting as a lifestyle. If you did not know that, if you were not here last night and got the memo when we announced that this is what we would be sharing about, ta-da! <laughs> but I say fasting is a lifestyle because I believe that there's a beauty in brokenness. I believe that there's a fellowship in suffering. There's an experience of Jesus that just cannot be had in any other place, any other way. You can't fake it. You can't buy it. You can't manufacture it. You can't influence your way into it. You can't massage other applications in order to get or reap the benefit of it. There is something that the Lord has packaged for those whose hearts and lives are willing to respond to the beauty that is found in the brokenness of fasting. I was standing over here during worship and I was just reminded of several instances over the years where the Lord invited me to a point that in the moment I believed was beyond myself. It was something on the other side of all of my fears, all of my hopes, all of my dreams, all of my ambitions, all of the ways that I was neatly, perfectly trying to package my life and set it off on a certain trajectory. There were just special moments where an intersection with Jesus happened and there was an invitation by the Spirit to trust Him and to put all of what I believed I was supposed to be down. And to walk across the threshold of my way, which many times is put together by the world's wisdom, which in many moments, seasons, instances, days, weeks, months, years, is developed by a fleshly initiation of activities, plans, pursuits, things that we believe are going to lead us or put us in the position for the things that we think we are really after. But we're a people who claim we've seen the king. And if you have caught a glimpse of this Jesus, you may have only seen a little, but in that little that you are able to perceive, you quickly realize that he is worth everything. And if we claim to have a glimpse, a revealing of this great king, then we understand that he is king. He's king, like it's settled. 
He's not voted in by popular opinion. This ain't some democracy where he won the popular vote. Therefore, even though there are many who disagree, he is what he is by way of political status or process. He's king, not because you or I say he is, but because the Father has presented him this way. And if he is king, then your life and my life should bend under the weight of the influence of this king. And I want to ask you, in what way right now is your life bending under the influence of this king? Because he's not just king in theory, but this king has a kingdom and he has a character. And there is a way that he influences those that have seen him, those that choose to yield to him, and those that are willing to partner in this life with and by his presence to become more like him, therefore allowing him a place in us to be revealed to the rest of the world around us. And fasting is just one of these unavoidable components. Don't tell me that you're willing to lay your life down if you're not willing to lose a meal. I doubt very highly that you'd be willing to die for him somewhere if you aren't willing to die to your natural cravings, your fleshly desires, if you're not willing to turn your heart away from your self-absorption to lose your life at the table. Don't for one moment think that it's somehow mysteriously, magically going to happen out on the street or in the mission field somewhere. But those of us that have been tenderized We've been softened by the cultivation of a yes deep down in our soul because of the face and the worth that has been revealed to us. We realize and we understand that it starts right here. But even in the denial of a single meal, it speaks higher of the allegiance of my heart and that my yes to him in the turning from the table is what begins to texturize my life and tenderize my soul. You see, fasting is a wonderful invitation. We all understand we're talking about not eating. That would be a very simple session. Don't eat in Jesus' name. But there's a wonderful invitation to brokenness in fasting. You see, years ago, I was on the backside of a 40. I'm just going to be real honest. I was in the closing days of a 40, day 38, 39, somewhere like there. I was like 138 pounds. For those of you that know me on a personal level, you understand that that's not normal. But I walked out into my garage. I work out in my garage. I've got a few gym items in my garage. And I walked into my garage and I looked around and Anna was out there with me. We were about to work out. We were on this 40 together. And I I just began to look around and I felt in my heart in the moment, the Lord asked me, are you willing to put this down? And I looked around at all this stuff, and I'm all for fitness, I'm all for being healthy, I'm all for whatever and all of that. But I looked around for a moment and I just burst into tears in my garage. Because in my heart I said, Lord, if this is something that you believe is standing between me and you, and if, if this is some sort of obstacle, some kind of hindrance, 
between me yielding to you in a way that would allow you to give yourself to me. You see, fasting is an increase in our capacity to host the person and the presence of Jesus. We are giving ourselves, if you would, an eviction notice continually and rooting out, uprooting all of the things that are in us that are rejecting his leadership, all of the things that are in us that are resisting his influence, all of the things that by the nature of who we are is opposing the way that God is willing to give himself to us on a consistent basis for us to host him as a real person and to live by way of embodiment under his reality and influence and I stood in my gym crying my eyes out and I said Lord if you're asking me to throw all of this away and to be reduced down and to live in the state of being, again, I was just being honest, Lord, a, a smaller person. Like if this is what it takes for you to give yourself to me the way that you want to give yourself to me, Lord, I may not have seen it before because extended fasting has a way of uncovering all of the hidden realities and attractions and persuasions of our hearts. Extended fasting, there's a place of confrontation with the real us and not the professional or perfected us that we know how to keep alive in the eyes when crowds are around. But in extended fasting, we get to know the us that Jesus knows. You see, because other people may know a you that you want them to know, but Jesus knows the you that you keep from everybody else. And I said, Lord, if there's something in all of this, I'll get rid of it. I'll get rid of it all. I'll get rid of it all because I want you. You see, we, we sing things like I want to be overcome by your presence, but to what degree do you actually mean that? To what degree are you willing to be inconvenienced by the influence of Jesus? <laughs> I don't like the way that sounds either. But to any of you that have actually been willing to bend under the weight of his influence, you understand that at times it's an inconvenience to things that you desire. It's an inconvenience to some of the ambitions or the dreams or the goals or the stature that you've developed by a worldly perspective. It's inconveniencing some of the things that you've been building. But at times the things that we've been building are the intentional things that God is trying to tear down. Because he understands that there are things in you that are opposing the way that I'm trying to give myself to you. There are things about you that are resisting what I'm trying to do in you. But if you would trust me and cross over the threshold of the you that you are continually trying to hold on to, I promise you it will be better than anything you've ever been able to build in your own strength over your entire life. Because as we yield to him, we give him room for him to form himself in us. And this is the goal. We want to be like him. Not just by behavioral traits. We can do ministry like him. We can prophesy like him. We can flow in gifts like him. But you can't fake what's in your face. And countenance is something that only comes by the Spirit. Countenance to have Jesus chiseled out of your face is something that only the Holy Ghost can do. And it only comes by way of bending under the weight of his influence. He wants to influence us. And in fasting, we find no greater, no more aggressive, no more accelerated way to be able to be conformed with great intensity and yes, overwhelming intimacy to the person of Jesus. There's something childlike in nature about believing that God could take a dietary modification and work a wonder by way of conforming you to more of the image of his son as a real person by simply abstaining or refraining altogether from certain foods or food in general. It takes a childlike foolishness, but thank God that unto the childlike, the ones, the little ones, such as these, is the kingdom. Because there's mysteries. 
that our lives are to embody. There's secrets in glory that God has packaged up for those that are willing to pursue, to contend, to go after, to deny. Because self-denial is the doorway to discipleship. And if you want to follow me, pick up your cross, deny yourself. To the degree that you are willing to say yes to Jesus and no to yourself, we will find the continual or the gradual increase of the person of Jesus being formed in who we are by real substance. Not just by fancy hashtags and Twitter quotes by real substance of who you are as an individual on a default level. The real you, the real programming of who you are in real life, in real time. It's what's so confounding about this vision of Jesus. Jesus didn't just preach or articulate a fancy vision. Jesus is vision. And because he speaks out of what he is, it becomes hostile. Because most times we speak out of what we know, what we've acquired over time as a head knowledge. But Jesus speaks out of what he is. He is God's vision. He is what God is doing. God's building program looks like, sounds like, feels like Jesus. And as you and I turn away from the plate and give our lives over to Jesus, Paul would have said it this way in Philippians 3, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his sufferings. Are you willing, willing, because this is, this is the beauty in the lowliness that we heard about even last night. God has all power, yet he says, will you? If you walk with Jesus, you quickly understand that he's not making you do anything. <laughs> this is the confounding of the world's wisdom. It's really great that I'm not God. Because I don't know if I'd be able to put up with some of the rebellion. I don't know if I'd be as long-suffering with some of the immaturity. I'm sure that there would come a moment, even in my own heart, in my own life, where I'd be like, okay, check it out. Either you get it together, you got two days, or it's a wrap for you. Like, <laughs> like hey, man, like, enough is enough. Like, I'm tired of playing the games. I'm done putting up with it. Like, it, it just it is what it is. Either you're in or you're out. But, hey, listen, it's on you. I'm going to let you choose, but just know there's real consequences. There's a penalty to this. He's so amazing, yet he's so kind. He understands that on the other side of your yes to him is the answer to all of your wildest dreams, the flourishing of all of your greatest potential, every packaged thing by way of deposit and impartation that he has put into you hinges on the yes that he must have from you in order to fulfill in you the things that he has always desired but he is so good that he refuses to take it from you he's all powerful yet he's not just going to puppeteer you and make you do things even when he knows that it's what's best for you and you keep running from it even when he knows that it's the answer to everything you've been crying out for, but you just won't surrender to it. But we want breakthrough. I want glitz and glamour and glory, and I want to... But he comes meek and low and soft and kind and patient and long-suffering, and he says, will you join me this way? Will you walk with me this way? I'm not going to make you do it. I have to have your yes. It's actually one of the greatest revealings of how powerful I am. I believe in my own influence even above your own. I believe in the way that I'm able to influence you greater than the way that you're able to influence you. I believe that over time, because of who I am, I can soften you to a degree where you will say yes to me, even in and against saying yes to yourself.
God believes so much in the deposit that he has put in you that he's willing to give it all in believing that over time his presence in you is eventually going to win over on your will. How incredible of a love that we have in this Jesus who says, will you follow me down this broken road so I can put you back together? You see, I was asked a question not long ago. I had someone ask me, they said, do you believe? They said, because bro, I'm just going to tell you, you're not normal. They said, do you believe that God has given you some special grace to be able to fast the way that you do and live the way that you do? Because, man, I don't know anybody like what you do as a regular life. Like, like it's got to be something that God has put on you. And I understand how entertaining of a question that potentially may be. I understand how we try to create these conversations, but most times what I want you to be able to see and to understand, even right now by the Spirit, is that this is just a neat way to exclude you from the conversation that God has wanted to include you in. Because it's much easier to be like, no, that's, that's him. That's his call. There's a grace on him. I don't have that grace. I don't have that call. That's not for me. That's for him. It goes along with what God's doing with him. It goes along with the things that need to accompany him. It's only something that God is willing to do with him because of the dream or the call or the goal or the vision. But what I want you to understand is that it has nothing to do with activity and it has everything to do with devotion. And by devotion, I'm not talking about the compartmentalization of, well, I've got an hour in the morning and I've got 30 minutes on the way to work. I'm talking about a yes in my heart that has torn every other thing wide open. I am raw. I am vulnerable. I am yielded. I am willing to lay down. I'm living in this thing with one goal, one mission. There's one desire, even as David wrote, and it is a constant Constant, not just when it applies to things that I prefer. Not just when it's packaged in a way that I believe it's going to help me get to the things that I'm really after. But there's a constant yes that I have to him. And I said, I, I need to not answer the question the way that you've asked it. I said, because that's dangerous. I said, I do believe that there's a grace on my life to fast. I said, but I believe that there's a grace on everybody's life to fast. It's just interesting to me how we would believe and how we would even convince our own hearts that God would choose to speak to someone other than a way that he was desiring to speak to me. It's just, it's absurd to me. I don't ever get questioned or confronted when I tell people God wants to bless you. Nobody's ever trying to argue their way out of being blessed being healed no no brother that's just not for me it's just not my call man I'm, I'm not called to be healed like like you just don't get it man that's for other folks that's for him that goes with his call that goes with his ministry that doesn't go for me you see we don't get to pick and choose the pieces of Jesus that we really like and then intentionally avoid and cut out of our response the things that we would rather not respond to rather when I see the way the Lord is influencing someone else's life it should constantly jealously provoke me to the place of prayer to say Lord how is it that they hear from you this way what is it in my heart that is not wide open enough for you to feel like you have the freedom to say that to me to feel like you have the room or that I would be willing to entertain or engage that type of conversation what is it that you've done in them that I have not yet been willing to pay the price for because I want him. 
And I said, I, I do believe that I've been invited to live a certain way. But I believe everybody has. I said, I just believe that over time, I have tried and failed and practiced and tried and failed and practiced and tried and failed and practiced to learn how to give a greater yes to him. Because it, it has grown over time. Because you understand when you're faithful with a little, he breathes on it and it grows and the stakes get higher and the cost becomes greater and the investment requires more. But as you learn how to say yes to him over time and you cultivate that yes, it begins to grow on the inside of you and your capacity begins to increase and you're able to withhold or to contain some of the most provoking words in all of the scriptures to me personally is when Jesus looks at those that walk closely with him and he says there are so many other things that I desire to say to you but you right now cannot bear them. To what degree is your life in this moment able to bear up under the invitation and the influence of Jesus? I said, man, I believe that the Lord has invited me to live a certain way because I understand this simple truth about God. If he's able to do it in one person, he can do it in everybody. Which is why Jesus becomes so important the firstborn from among the dead. He now leads a host. But if God can get it done in one person, it eliminates the excuses in everybody else. There's no more gray area. There's no more wiggle room. There's no more cop out. There's no more way to avoid. If God is able to gain a yes out of one heart by way of his influence on one life, then God is able to influence and he's able to gain that same yes and I said, I believe that I've been invited in to live a certain way, yes, only because God desires this for everybody. You see, there's something for me about being around those that have a yes to Jesus that provokes me. There's something about getting around a company, a group, one person, even if it must be, who has a yes who has a yes. You see, because it, it does something by way of confrontation in my heart. It does something by way of radical, uh, let's say, exposing in my heart. And I want God to take everything out. Everything out that is resisting the image of Jesus. You see, I, I recently was invited, oh man, there's no easy way to say it, um, invited into, let's say, a lifestyle of fasting that was much more developed than uh, things that I've seen historically. In fact, when the Lord spoke to me and invited me, uh, I, my eyes actually filled up with tears because of how painful the invitation was but I realized in the moment when the tears began to come out of my face I said Lord there's something still in me that wants me there's something still alive in me that wants my own way that wants me to be established in a place of comfort or safety. There's something in me still wrestling for its independence. I said, Lord, I need this. You see, you can look at it one of two ways. You can think, oh, no, no, that can't be God. Nope, no, no way, no, that's way too painful, that's way too wild, like never heard anybody say anything like that. I bind you, devil, in the name. Or you can, you can recognize 
Lord, you're saying this to me because whether I understand it or not, I am in desperate need of what you are inviting me into. You see, there's a threshold in all of us that God is constantly challenging. He's constantly challenging the current boundaries of your yes to him. He's constantly standing just over the other side of all of your fears, all of your hopes, and he stands and he beckons. Come running to me. Trust me. Deny yourself. And this is the place of fasting. Fasting is not a special call. It is a call to everyone that claims to love him. Jesus said, when they fast, fast this way. He said, the bridegroom's with them now. They don't need to, but in the day the bridegroom is taken, then my followers, my disciples, will be found fasting. John the Baptist was a man who came in fasting and prayer. <laughs> there are a million other things that I could say, but I, I really sensed a specific lane this morning that God is looking for a place of greater influence in your heart. And as you learn to yield your yes to him, our lives are actually able to become a weapon in the hand of the Lord. Because we cannot talk about things like Esther chapter 4, where an entire nation, a people group, are preserved. God supernaturally breaks in, exposes the intentions of the enemy, overrides the designs of weapons formed against them, is able to radically eradicate all of what the enemy was intending to do and to bring his people, his possession, into a place of victory by simply turning from food for three days we need a battle strategy. Don't eat or drink for three days. Okay, no, we're serious. Like, for real, like we're about to die. Don't eat or drink for three days. Because you don't only get to give a yes in moments that you think matter to you. There's got to be a broken yes in private that we learn how to develop before we get to be put on stages where God is able to then use that same yes that he knows he has already secured that has been tested over time where he now gets to use that same yes for public displays of great power the great power and the display is when God wins your yes in private but many of us are longing and looking for the day when we can stand out on some public platform and then give a yes to Jesus. But David understood even in the face of Goliath. He said, this ain't my first fight. He said, once there was a lion, once there was a bear. What's he saying, man? He's saying, I've been fighting for years. I've been trusting him for years. I've given him my yes, and it's been tested over time. This is the first time that you may have the ability or the vantage point to see me fighting, but I've been fighting all my life. We win in private. And then, with things the Lord speaks, all types of public victory and demonstrations of power but the issue is simple it is where I began it is where I'm going to pray for you now I'm going to ask Dave to come even as we sang you allowed these words to come across the threshold of your lips you're welcome here And I want to be overcome 
by your presence. I'm just going to ask you to put your hand on your heart right now. Lord, in this space, I'm asking you to make our hearts very sensitive. Lord, we want to know you. We want to be those because you said we're supposed to be. My sheep know my voice and another they will not follow. We want to be completely, wholly, totally sold out to your voice. Lord, even when it goes against things we may be intentionally trying to build, Lord, even when it goes against things that may not even necessarily be bad or sinful, but they're just wrong for us. And Lord, I'm praying for each one right now because I believe that you jealously, you've given us all of yourself. But Lord, we want to learn, we want to practice, we want to obey so that we can host you well. Lord, break what needs to be broken. Every conversation, every excuse, every in intellectualized argument that we have put together, every lie we've bought into, And Lord, as crazy as this sounds, would you raise up a company of people wildly possessed by the Holy Ghost, freely, joyfully denying themselves because we found the beauty in brokenness and we found the one who awaits us out in the deep waters on the threshold of our hopes, dreams, and fears, who beckons us and welcomes us. Crossover. Crossover. Let's wait just a moment. I'm believing the Lord to speak to you right now.